Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today on this webinar. And today is all about celebrating women entrepreneurs. International Women's Day was just two days ago, and it's wonderful to get everyone together in this virtual space to celebrate women entrepreneurs. We know that a rising tide raises all ships, and together with the Penticton business community, we are lifting up one another through the power of collaboration. So today we have an inspiring panel featuring local women business owners, not-for-profits, to support one another. They'll share how they've been able to leverage their business and community partnerships to overcome some of their biggest challenges in the past year. And so it's really wonderful to have everyone here. Um, I, I understand most people are from Penticton. Uh, I physically am located in Kelowna, which is on the traditional and unceded territory of the Okanagan Silks Nation. So um, I give gratitude to be on this space uh, and uh, recognize that um, the, the path to truth and reconciliation is, is one that is um, a lifelong commitment. So uh, it's really an honor to be here and recognize um, the, the lands that others are joining us from. So I will share our agenda of what you can expect for today. So again, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. In a moment, we are gonna get into a panel discussion where we will hear all about these stories that we're talking about. And it's really about um, highlighting effective partnerships and effective collaborations. And so our idea is to um, get you inspired and, and get your wheels turning about how you can create these partnerships in your business. But then your question might be, how do I actually go about doing that? So that's why we've invited in uh, the next half is a lawyer, Hannon Campbell, who will outline important steps that you can take to address the legal aspect of your business partnerships and collaborations. So it's uh, a really great uh, fit from inspiration to actually doing it. So we're excited to have um, just that diverse panel here today. Then we'll move into some Q&A. So today is meant to be really uh, interactive and throughout the panel, we will uh, encourage you to send in your questions. That Q&A session um, might be to anyone. Maybe there was a burning question that came to your mind that we didn't cover in the panel. And that question can also be directed to our, our um, uh, lawyer on site. So, and then we'll close with some prizes. Uh, everyone loves some prizes. Everyone uh, who has registered will have their name in the draw and uh, we'll be featuring that at the very end of the session. So um, a little bit about how this event came to be. This event is a three-way partnership between the Chamber of Commerce, um, the Penticton and Wine Country Chamber of Commerce, the Penticton Women in Business, and WeBC. And we really see this partnership of these three organizations coming together to put an event um, together is an example of a really amazing collaboration. We've been able to leverage our different uh, networks. Um, even in advertising this event, we were able to utilize all of our di different networks, um, get a diverse panel together. So we're really hoping that this event in itself will be an example of ways that we can collaborate with one another. So I'm going to start by introducing WeBC as an organization, and we're just one of the three organizations that we're here to uh, put this event together. So thank you so much um, to the Chamber and to Penticton Women in Business for this uh, collaboration. Okay, so Women's Enterprise Center, who are we? Uh, you may know us as Women's Enterprise Center. We recently went through a rebrand this year, and it's been a lot of fun getting to know, re-getting to know ourselves as an organization. And 
seeing who we are in the ecosystem. And uh, so we're a not-for-profit. We support women business owners all around BC. So that's why I'm in Kelowna. Um, we're partnering in Penticton and we uh, try to support the entire province of BC. We've been doing this for 26 years. So we've been around for quite a while. And we have our physical offices in Kelowna and Vancouver. And we've got a team spread all over the province. And so drilling down to what it is that we do, we provide a holistic approach uh, by offering access to capital, capacity building, skills development, and resources. And our passion is to empower women entrepreneurs to their business success. And these are the key services that we offer. So we offer a loans program up to $150,000 for uh, majority owned and operated businesses but owned by a woman. And we can lend to husband wife teams. We offer free business advice. So uh, Don McCooey is one of our wonderful advisors who's been with us for many, many years, helped thousands of women entrepreneurs through our free business advising. We also have skills development workshops. So lots of different topics on exporting, building your business, marketing, any kind of business topic, we've probably done a workshop on it. And most of them are free or very highly subsidized. And we also have mentoring programs. So if you're looking to get a group of women together, we do peer mentoring, we do one-on-one -on -one mentoring, and sometimes we do uh, creative mentoring groups on specific um, um, industries, or sometimes we get immigrant women together or indigenous women together. So we can be really creative in that space. And then lastly, we offer a supportive community. So this is a great example of getting women entrepreneurs together to realize that we are not alone. Um, you're not in your business by yourself. You've got the supportive community around you and we're hoping that you know on hard days you can give us a call or reach out to your network and and realize that you're not in it alone so that's um all the airtime i'll take up for talking about webc and i'll pass it over to our partners well i'm marlene trenham and i'm with penticton women in business and the penticton chamber of commerce and it's a pleasure to work cooperatively with um, with this group. Um, we did an event similar to this last year. We enjoyed it so much. We thought, let's come back and do it again. So Penticton Women in Business is an organization that has been around for just over 21 years. And I have been the administrator of that group since the beginning. And uh, it is an honor this year to have cooperated with the chamber and brought our, our uh, work with women in business under the, the chamber umbrella as well. And that's just a very brief introduction to Penticton Women in Business. Our purpose is to, to provide a networking uh, space, uh, an opportunity for education, for sharing, for, uh, for fun, for learning and growing. And we do that cooperatively with all women and those who uh, are interested in working with us and with the chamber. So I'm going to pass it over to Diane to tell a little bit about the chamber. All right. Yes, I'm I'm so happy to be here. My name's Diane Kirk. I'm with the uh, Chamber of Commerce. I'm the executive director. The Chamber of Commerce has been around since 1907. So it's a very, very long standing organization. I'm really excited about the 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 path of the chamber now is because we're getting out there and creating absolutely wonderful partnerships which we'll prop will elaborate more on later but just want to say welcome everybody and hope you take a lot away from this today and i'm going to pass it on now to pat good morning i'm uh, i'm pat dick i'm one of the uh, owners of cannery brewing here in uh, in penticton we are a microbrewery uh, that is in its 21st year. So in this relatively uh, new industry, we uh, are kind of long in the tooth and uh, we are delighted to, uh, to, to be sharing. Uh, for us here at the Cannery, uh, collaborations have been part of what we've always done. 
uh, it, uh, I, I say repeatedly uh, uh, that it's all about relationships for us. And so those relationships happen on lots of levels, whether they're business to business uh, collaborations or whether they're collaborations with nonprofits, uh, whether they're collaborations with just individuals uh, in, the, uh, in the community. So uh, uh, delighted to, uh, to be here with everybody else today. So good morning. And I'll turn it over to whoever's next. I can't see here. How about Kim? <laughs> Morning, Kim. Morning, Pat. Um, is it all right if I introduce myself, Diane and Marlene? Wonderful. I'm Kim Palmer. I'm the executive director of the Okanagan School of the Arts here in Penticton. Um, and I'm also the community manager at Cowork Penticton. Um, and uh, today, specifically, we're uh, I'm talking about uh, a recent partnership that I've started uh, with Sarah at Graphically Hip for our Junior Preneur program. And uh, I guess I'll pass it over to Sarah. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming today. My name is Sarah Tucker. I own Graphically Hip, which is a promotional um, branding, design, and marketing company. And we recently just started a program called Junior Preneur. And it is a program where we teach kids how to start their own businesses. And we just completed our first class on Tuesday. So I'm here, as Kim said, to talk about my partnership with the Okanagan School of the Arts on that project. Wonderful. Okay, so uh, now we're going to jump into the panel portion. Um, so I hope everyone can see uh, our panelists spotlighted. Did that work for everyone? Excellent. Okay, so we've already done the round of introductions. Um, it's great to have a full panel. Um, we've got three different examples of partnerships on this panel today. So we've got a business and nonprofit partnership. That's a partnership between Sarah Tucker of Graphically Hip and Kim Palmer of the Okanagan School of the Arts. So thank you both for being here. We also have a business to business partnership example, um, which is Pat Dick from Cannery Brewing. Now, Pat also has many examples of community partnerships that we're going to talk about um, and, and to give diversity to the panel. She is going to talk about, uh, you know, that was business to business collaborations. And then we've got not for profit to not for profit, which is the Penticton Women in Business and Penticton Chamber of Commerce, how they came together in collaboration. So Marlene Trenholm, thank you uh, for being here to talk to that. And Di Diane Carlock, who's going to talk about um, the Penticton Chamber relationship. And so, yes, my name is Danielle Andrews and I'm uh, the outreach officer at EBC. I've been here for seven years and seen lots of different creative collaborations between our organizations through businesses. And um, I'm really looking forward to leveraging these examples to hopefully inspire you to look at your community and seeing what strategic partnerships you can create this year in 2022. So let's move on to our first question. So I'm going to start with Pat. Um, I'm curious if you can tell us about a business partnership that you have um, collaborated with. Tell us about what happened. The craft brew industry, especially here in, uh, in Penticton is a, a really good example of a collaboration. Right now we're trying to find a name for our collective because we haven't really got a name for our collective. Uh, but uh, it represents all of the microbreweries in, in the Penticton area. The craft brew industry works really hard at um, being uh, collaborative and working together is, uh, is, is important for lots of ways. In, in any industry or in any organization, the more people and groups that you have banded together, the better your clout, the, the more power you have when you speak. The, uh, uh, the greater your network, the broader your network, the net you cast is, is just that much larger. And so that's important, but it's also a challenge in an industry where by definition, 
you're all in competition with each other. And so it's like a family. And like all families, it has its ups and its downs and uh, uh, it has its issues and it has its uh, personalities and uh, people who, uh, who run their own business are usually pretty tenacious and uh, usually pretty independent. And so it's kind of like herding cats sometimes, uh, but we are all really committed to it and we all work really hard at that. This is an industry uh, with very specific equipment and very specific ingredients and very specific needs. Alcohol is a, is a different animal than uh, many other things that you would manufacture because it comes with such heavy uh, government regulations. Uh, it also is very equipment specific. Our fellows here uh, can't go to Canadian Tire and get a spare part for a broken down piece of, of equipment. So they'll be knocking on the door of another craft brewery uh, or whether it's a bag of grain or whether it's hops or whether it's yeast or uh, something has broken down, your brewer is sick, we just all step in to make that happen. And uh, it is work, uh, but it has a huge reward in lots of ways uh, because you really are not completely alone. Although as anyone who is in business for themselves uh, would, would probably attest, we all are alone many, many times. And uh, it's nice sometimes to feel like you're not. Thanks, Pat. And to uh, follow up with a question, so um, we've been talking about a rising tide raises all ships. So why are you motivated to supporting other breweries that may be looked at as competition? How does that in turn um, rise the tide for your business? We've always felt that the more people that are making really good craft beer, the better it is for our industry as a whole, especially at the very beginning, 21 years ago when we started, we were certainly uh, uh, craft beer missionaries where we were desperately trying to get people to try something other than the, the, the mainstream loggers. And uh, it was an up, uphill battle then. And I think that at any point in time, you remember what that was like. So for the new ones coming on, it's, uh, it just seems like second nature to, to extend a hand and say, yeah, we could, we, we've been there, we can help with, the, with that part. But sometimes you have really major lobbying to do. Um, alcohol is a huge cash cow for every uh, government jurisdiction in the world and comes with lots of regulations and comes with lots of times where government wants to pull a lot back. Uh, and we're not really... Uh, able to give back sometimes. So it's nice to have other people uh, uh, saying the same things as you are saying. It, it just gives your voice that much more clout. Great, okay, I think that's a wonderful example. And so now I'm going to turn it over to Sarah and Kim. So I understand um, that you are working on a partnership. How did this come to be? Um, what, what was the inception of the idea? Take us through what happened? Um, so Kim, I guess I can answer this one. Uh, the inception came from uh, the thought that kids should be exposed to being able to start their own business because often they aren't told that. Um, they're just told after school, you go to college or you go to university or you get a job. So um, just having, just giving them the opportunity and opening their eyes to the fact that it's possible was the inception. Um, from there, I designed the curriculum and um, the workbook. And then I believe it was Miranda from Okanagan School of the Arts reached out to me. She saw, she must have saw something I posted online or something like that, I think, and then asked if um, they could be of any help in any way. And then Kim and I connected over lunch at Match and uh, discussed just all the ins and outs and the what it was going to cost me to use them to take over my registrations and um, handle communications with parents and that sort of thing. Yeah, and just to follow up on what Sarah said, when uh, she initially came to me with the concept, it's like, well, great, you've got everything you need. Um, the powerful part for the Okanagan School of the Arts was realizing we've got a registration system, we've got forms we've used for previous programs, and this can be a value for a business who wants to enter into our realm. Um, 
of teaching classes and, and putting that out to the public. Um, and then uh, things came together really well with us discovering that we had something that uh, could really help the junior preneur uh, program move forward. And then we got to add something really exciting and new to our roster of uh, programming. Mm -hmm. And so Sarah, I'm curious because your main business is uh, marketing, you know, graphically hip, you wear so many hats. So what, what inspired you to say, you know what, I can take this on and, um, and this is kind of a leading question, but did you feel like you could do it alone, you know, to, to, you have this inspiration idea, what, what was your kind of thought of, okay, I'm going to do this alone. What are my next steps here? So I started my business as a graphic designer, starting a business and, um, very quickly just fell in love with being in business and being an entrepreneur and looking for new entrepreneurial opportunities. I was definitely naive in thinking I could do this alone at the beginning. <laughs> um, even with, you know, I've got my own website where I very easily could have taken registrations, but I don't have the time. So because I wear so many hats, that's where my relationship and partnership with OSA was integral to getting this program going. Um, just, I don't know how many man hours Kim has put into this or woman hours, I should say, but it's far more than I know I could have handled. So I will be forever grateful to the OSA for that. And I, I, as I said, it was about realizing this value that we have to offer of taking the time and then the enormous value that it pulls in for our organization because we're finding that um, we're building similar audiences. So a teen who may be signed up for the junior preneur uh, class, their parent is now subscribed to our newsletter and finds out about a pottery class or an acting class. And then we start to spread our network and our other programming in ways that we didn't expect. Mm, yeah, that positive ripple effect. That's great. Thank you. And so now I'll turn it over to Marlene and Diane to talk about your partnership, how it came to be. Both of your organizations have been in existence for many, many years. So why now for um, this collaboration? I think the time was right, thanks to COVID. Um, we have partnered with the chamber on many activities and events over the, the 21 years of existence of Penticton Women in Business. Uh, many of the members of PWIB are also members of the chamber. We felt that with both organizations being so dedicated to um, entrepreneurs, business, education, networking, that maybe it was time for us to move hand in hand instead of just side by side. And with COVID coming and so many changes in so many people's work and their ability to participate in two or more meetings a month and pay two memberships and those kinds of things we felt that if we came together, it would allow people to have one membership, one event each month to participate in, and then add the extras, the, the networking, the educational events, those kinds of things when they can. Diane, your thoughts? Yeah, yeah. so, and if people know me, they, they know that I tell it just as it is. There's no, <laughs> there's no gray it is. So when I first joined the chamber, I have to say, Marlene, I mean, she is just such a blessing and she's such an asset to whatever, whatever her cause is. She approached me very early at, about the idea of women in business joining the chamber. And I have to be honest and say, I, I was green at the time. I was a little offish on the idea because I wasn't quite cer certain about the atmosphere, the the, 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 the job load, the other relations. But over time, as I watch the women in business and how much they do in the community and how active they, they are and how passionate every one of them is, I just thought to myself, oh my goodness, I, this would be absolutely silly, stupid, ridiculous 
for the chamber not to to um, partnership with, with women in business, especially since we were doing so many things in parallel, and especially since by joining together, we could make such a stronger uh, team and kind of alleviate a lot of the, the, the duplicate work we were doing and combine it together. So it has just been so far a really fabulous partnership. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so have you been surprised by new opportunities that have come out uh, through this partnership? I mean, uh, this event could be an example, um, but are you also seeing uh, ripple effects between the collaboration of uh, expertise, uh, passion, ideas, just the, the roll up your sleeves and let's just get it done that for any small organization, that is just such a breath of fresh air. That's from the chamber perspective, Marlene. I agree. I think that um, working together has brought to the forefront for the women in business members who were maybe not quite as familiar with all of the activities of the chamber, the opportunities that are there for them, aside from the fact that they now have access to the uh, benefits program for their employees and those kinds of things, they also now have access to much more educational uh, opportunities, uh, many more networking events and things, especially as we start to open up again and are able to do um, more networking. There's, there's a broad range of people. And although our programming with the Penticton Women in Business Committee is still focused on the, the women in business things were open to all to attend. And as we network with, with other businesses that may be more male oriented, we're going to learn and grow from that as well. So definitely the experiences are, are just growing all the time. Fantastic. Okay, and so Pat, I'll, I'll turn it back to you again. So I'm curious about what some of your most rewarding experiences are that you've gained through community or business partnerships, because we did mention that you've got experience in both. Mm. Well, as I said, the business uh, uh, experiences, the business to business kind of collaborations are, are always rewarding. But for me personally, uh, the, the most rewarding ones have been the charitable ones that we do. When we first uh, opened the tap room in this new purpose built building that we built, uh, we had a large space that was somewhat empty at that point in time. And we're able to uh, collaborate with a lot of, uh, a lot of art to council things, a lot of uh, charitable things uh, that needed a big space to hold their usually a fundraising uh, event. And some of those have just been incredibly uh, rewarding to, uh, to do, incredibly rewarding for me, incredibly rewarding for our staff, and ending up being a very good thing for our business. At the beginning of our time here on Ellis, the, the tap room it, and it was a kind of a new concept that it would be not really a bar, but a place where you could drink beer, uh, but you didn't have to, uh, a place just to gather. Uh, and so getting people in the door, like women my age, was, oh, they wouldn't want to go to a bar. Uh, so it was, a, it was a challenge, too. So we did a, 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 it was a nice benefit from a lot of the charitable things that we did and a lot of the things we did with the Arts Council. The people were able to come in and go, okay, I can, I can come here. This is an okay place and uh, ended up benefiting uh, business as well. So that's certainly a win-win in, in that situation. But as I say, for me personally, those were... Uh, and still are some of the most rewarding uh, things that we do. Mm -hmm. And um, earlier you were telling me about um, an event called Petachuchi? Petachucha. So Petachucha. Pet okay, can you tell us about that? Certainly can. It, it still blows me away. We're going to have another one coming up the end of March, and we're so grateful to be able to uh, to get back into uh, to that. COVID certainly uh, eliminated that. Pechakucha in Japanese means chit chat. And the premise is that you would have fundamentally 20 speakers who are speaking to 20 slides for 20 seconds for each slide. And it's absolutely and utterly fascinating. You learn things about people that you think you know really well that you just didn't know. You get to, 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 to hear so many fascinating stories 
uh, each of the Pecha Kusha sessions has a bit of a theme and uh, the, the speakers are, are predominantly speaking to that, to, to that theme. I, every single solitary time we, we put it together, I think, oh, I don't know whether anybody's gonna come and the tickets sell out in two days. Just, it's just, I, I've decided that the human race that we're all just a bunch of big gossips and we want to know everybody else's story, but it's absolutely yeah. fascinating. So yes, they, uh, they, they are fun and uh, uh, raise the funds that enable that to, uh, to, to keep going. Wonderful. Okay. And so Kim and Sarah, I know that um, took a lot of effort to get your, um, you know, the registration side of things going. And I'm curious how you were able to market this program. Were you able to leverage your different uh, groups? Can you talk a little bit about that cross promotion that happens with, um, you know, parents subscribing to your newsletter? So how did you utilize both of your networks to market this new program? I think I got to give this one to Kim because all I do is post it on Instagram and Facebook. I got a page on my website. Kim does absolutely everything else. So you, you she can probably speak better to that. Well, and uh, it, it was one of the things that uh, helped me establish how to work with other uh, partners in the future is, is as I was walking into this with Sarah, it's like, well, I have a checklist of how I market my programs. So I was able to pass that along to her and say, this is what's going to happen if uh, we do work on this together because i'll be working through this checklist which involves posting it on the chambers calendar on the uh penticton uh the penticton arts council calendar which then goes to the travel penticton calendar um castanet and all of those groups are all connected um now that being said a lot of our registrants found out about our classes from social media so the fact that Sarah would be posting things on her graphically hip and or the junior printer pages that she created gave me lots of great content to then repost onto our social media. Um, but it, it was just a question of working through those partnerships and trying to get the word out because that's been the single, single biggest block for the Okanagan School of the Arts since we left the Shatford Center. People think we disappeared. We didn't. We've got classes on offer. It's just been about getting that information out to people uh, because we've got great things to offer. Mm -hmm. Great. So uh, a follow-up question is around how the actual process worked. So um, Kim, I understand you're really uh, organized with contracts and agreements, and I'm sure our presenter, Hannon, will give you two thumbs up around that. Can you talk about what happened when you both came together and said, yes, we're going to do this partnership. Let's get it down on paper. What, did, what process did you guys follow? I have a standard agreement that I use for all of my instructors. I have a very diverse group of people out there teaching my program. Uh, so I was able to bring a template to Sarah and say, this is the standard that I use. What do we need to adjust? Uh, but it's been something that's been very important to me in this role is getting things document documented so that our partners, our facilitators know what they're getting into so that they feel protected and so that they know that their time and efforts are being valued by the organization by laying out very clearly how funds and responsibilities are being divided. Mm -hmm. And Sarah, so when when that was clearly communicated with you, did that help alleviate any challenges or what what was that experience like? Yeah, so we kind of discussed most of this over our initial lunch meeting. And um, I can remember specifically thinking, first of all, this is really good food, but also um, <laughs> what a sigh of relief it was to know that she had kind of, she, I hadn't seen the checklist at this point, but just from what she was telling me, I had just the most confidence that she was going to take what I'd worked so hard on um, and make it work and make it available to people. Um, and there was just never any doubt that this was the right way to go. 
So yeah, those expectations were clear, clearly defined up front. So you didn't go into the relationship expecting one thing or the other and maybe being disappointed. It was really clear and communicated. Correct. And yeah. um, there was even like a, a brief period of negotiations on uh, dollar amounts and things like that. And Kim was just very transparent and very um, forthcoming, I guess. It, yeah, Kim's the best. If anyone needs a partnership, go see Kim. Back at you, Sarah. Awesome. Glad to hear that. Um, and so I'm curious, Marlene and Diane, between your organizations, how the agreements happen as well. Um, you both have board of directors. Mm -hmm. So the process may be a little more complicated. Tell me about what you had to do and what that experience was like. Well, we started with discussions, um, Diane and myself, and then with the executive of Penticton Women in Business and the operating staff at the chamber. And we went back and forth with ideas and suggestions. And well, if we did this, how would it work? And if we did this, how would it work? And then we went to both boards and said, this is an idea we're playing with. You know, do you want us to pursue it? Um, is it something that's worth looking at more deeply between the two organizations? Or should we just let it go? And both groups were very interested because they could see the potential and the, the partnership just seemed to work. <clears throat> and so, yes, we went through that whole process of going to the boards and the executives and then uh, coming up with a terms of reference uh, for what Penticton Women in Business would do within the Chamber of Commerce. And outlining that the same as the other committees of the chamber, there's terms of reference for ad advocacy, for nominations, for uh, governance, for events. There's um, all, so we developed a terms of reference that went back and forth a few times as well between both groups with each saying, well, I wanna make sure we're covered on this. And I wanna make sure that th this is included. And, we eventually came to the point where it was approved by both organizations and we came together and it just worked really well that it happened at the end of Penticton Women in Business membership year, which allowed us to start fresh at the beginning of January with the chamber. And that is the beginning of the chamber's membership year as well. So Diane, any other comments to add to that? Uh, no, just um, we cannot emphasize enough how how important terms of reference are. So mm -hmm. anything you do, letter of agreement, it, it may sound a little Mickey Mouse to begin with. And you think, well, let's just do the handshake. We know each other. But over time, people change, situations change. COVID is a prime example. Those terms of reference are great. And they don't have to be lawyer quality, although there, there are some cases they should be. But even a simple uh, letter agreement, uh, um, we're, we're going into a situation working with Travel Penticton, we're going to for the first time kind of co-share the summer staff, we're doing a letter of agreement just to make sure that everything is clear and there's no gray spots. Right, uh, we say at WBC, even, even if you're getting into business with your mom or your best friend, it is so important to put those agreements in place up front so the law doesn't have to yeah and and it's a really a, a way to communicate with your your partner that I respect you I am upholding myself to these standards versus a, a negative thought pattern which might be oh uh, you don't trust me it's actually the opposite is I want you to trust me so this is why I'm I'm, I'm doing this and it's been said so many times that, <clears throat> especially when going into business with your partner or spouse or your sister or your mother, that it's best to get those terms of agreement all sorted out while you're still friends and while you still like each other, because things do happen. Mm -hmm. Right, right. 
Okay, and um, Pat, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. So I thought it was really interesting, your comments uh, as we were preparing for this around how uh, the brewery industry is, is really regulated. And so how these partnerships may look a little bit different. Can you expand on that for us? Mm. They need to be incredibly transparent. Uh, and that is, is mostly because uh, of all of the things that affect everybody's uh, ability to have partnerships of any kind, but also because in the world of, of alcohol, you just have to be incredibly transparent. So for example, um, I might do something with Slackwater and uh, Slackwater is gonna pay me for a part of, of, of what this collaboration is because the, the beer that we're collaborating on is brewed here. If it's brewed here, it has to be sold here. It has to be sold through our license. It has to be taxed through our taxation system. But in my books, I've got this uh, this check from Slackwater that's going to go into our deposit book, and it's got to go in there completely and utterly categorized. It's just as transparent as it can possibly be. In in the world of alcohol, you just know that you are always going to see auditors. They will come and they'll move in for a week. You might have federal aud auditors. You might have the auditors from the LDB. You might have who knows who else. Uh, in uh, CRA, you can have all sorts of auditors and you absolutely have to be able to, ex to explain every transaction. So a, a transaction that would seem fairly simple for Liam at Slackwater to give me a check for $400 to pay for the grain and a few other things that went into the collaborative brew. If I just have a, 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 an entry in a deposit book that says Slackwater Brewing for $400, CRA or LDB or Excise is going to say, what is this? What's going on here between the two of you? Are you collaborating and selling out the back door and not giving us our, uh, our shekels uh, of, of taxation? So that certainly creates uh, a, a need for uh, transparency. But that's that's throughout everything that, that we do, and it, it's interesting as I listen to, uh, to 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 these other great folks talking about uh, the need for uh, uh, having terms of reference, for having contracts, for having things set up. It I would absolutely agree, but at the same time, I have to say we haven't done that. Uh, we've done an awful lot through uh, through the years just with a handshake, with the exception of most of the things that we do with nonprofits, because of course nonprofits are using somebody else's money. And they have to be transparent. They have to be able to say where that money has gone. And so we've had contracts with uh, with nonprofits, and and uh, that's been an interesting kind of thing. But I would certainly agree with the with the other women speaking here that uh, going forward, that would be a very important thing uh, as as we look at this industry where I'm now the senior uh, oldie fogey. Uh, if if I'm not here, some of the the verbal contracts that I've made become very, very difficult for somebody else to uh, to say, well, this is what Pat said. Uh, and if I'm here, then yeah, this is what Pat said. And that was would be the way it happened. So I would certainly recommend uh, looking at uh, at tightening all of those things up and would certainly echo the, uh, the idea that if you're uh, partnering with family and friends, that that's probably more important than anything is to make sure every everybody understands what those words mean and what those words would mean going forward. So yeah, interesting differences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I think that's a really realistic approach that you know some things are done over handshakes and you've built those relationships for, for years. And so as, as um, if there's any transitions that happen, how to uh, continue those those relationships. So I think it's really important that you you mention that and and it's just the way of doing business. And you know, some are handshakes, some are formal. And when when does it come to the point where it's it's an important uh, step to take to to and, and to get that much firmer? We do an awful lot through email trains. And uh, as you go through that chain of of emails, you can see how things have uh, have progressed. Uh, and what everybody's expectations are. Often our collaborations are for a specific event. So it isn't a long-term thing going on for uh, a long time. Many of our long-term things uh, are collaborations with nonprofits and, and are a little more uh, formally set up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great point. And, and uh, just to, if I could just jump in quickly, mm -hmm. uh, Danielle, to completely agree with some of what's Pat saying, as a not-for-profit, we're responsible to 
you know, the city of Penticton who funds us to the various charitable foundations uh, for, to the BC Gaming Commission, <clears throat> to all of our members, to uh, my board of directors. So that transparency becomes very important for us because we need to be earning the trust of the people who are funding us to fulfill our mission. Um, so it's important to us to figure out first of all that what we're doing does still fit the mission of the organization as and fits what we're telling the rest of the world that we're doing um, and then we want to be very clear if we are partnering with for-profit businesses because uh, we, we need to look after ourselves because without that funding survival is very challenging <laughs> yeah fair enough fair enough and and even looking at um the times right now economic climate um, I'm curious if you think that business and uh, community collaborations are becoming more and more relevant than ever due to um, what we're seeing uh, locally and globally. And um, Diane, I'll, I'll pose this question to you. Um, Can you just repeat that again? Sorry, you, I was listening to Kim and, and my mind, of course, was rolling on to another idea I had. For <laughs> oh, if you want to share that, go for it. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, so okay. what? what um, yeah, yeah. So I'm um, curious about the relevancy of partnerships and collaborations now, given our economic climate. So looking oh, okay. changes okay. and trends. Okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you know what, that one, um, I, during this last couple of years with COVID, one of the biggest challenge, uh, I think that any um, business or sole partner could say is isolation, the isolation of and not having any type of references to to reach out to to kind of share ideas, it could be very stressful. And so partnerships that are developed are a great avenue to reach out, to find the climate so you're not there thinking on your own, trying to make decisions on your own, wondering what the perception of the public is gonna be. Um, I know for us, the Chamber, some of the, the relationships that uh, we've uh, uh, established that have been very strong over the last couple of years is, is for instance, with the Women in Business, the Downtown Business Association, PETA, um, one of the really big ones is, okay, we got this. The chambers across the valley started connecting um, a year and a half ago, well, about two years ago. Um, it, it, it takes a lot of time because we meet every two weeks, but now we're at a point where we can, we can, we can gauge eat the community as a whole across the valley instead of just Penticton, instead of just one core, core set of individuals. We've got a feel across the valley and we don't always agree on things, but once again, that's really good things to know because that's basically um, the, the nature of the beast is, is that how do we, how do we um, capture our audience, our clients, our membership base? Um, how do we make them all happy? And what is, what is various opinions out there? Because it's amazing what you learn by partnering with other um, associations. Um, you might think you're going down the right road and then someone from another association say, well, you know what, we did a survey with our members and this is how they feel. And that just kind of opens up a whole new uh, perspective on how to view, view things. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and so I'm curious if any of our attendees have questions for our panelists. Um, I'll pose it to you. You can start thinking about what questions might be, you can pose it in the chat um, and, and to keep the conversation going while, while you uh, think of your own questions for, for our panel. Um, Sarah, in preparation for this, we were talking about this trend of, of partnership um, being uh, more accessible, more interested in this next generation. Can you talk a bit more about that? Yeah, so um, something that I personally am passionate about is uh, friendly comp competition, something that I talk about on my podcast all the time. Um, and I just feel that there is a very old school way of doing business these, that, that is still lingering where you have to be cutthroat and you have to be ultra competitive. And um, it's just not, that's not my personal style of business. 
I collaborate with a bunch of my competitors, both locally and outside of Penticton. Um, you know, same thing that Pat was saying with, you know, if I run out of a certain color of vinyl to make someone's decal, I can call up Dwayne at Okanagan Sign Group and he'll have it for me like that day, probably in the next half hour. So it's just for me, I truly believe in being able to have your your competition, but also being able to help each other out, especially in these times. Um, and that doesn't stop in just business. That also applies to the nonprofits. I'm also the vice president of JCI Penticton, and um, we collaborate all the time with other nonprofits. And it, it is very important, especially in in these COVID times that we stick together. And I, I want to follow up on that as well, because I think there is sometimes a perception with the different arts organizations in Penticton. There are a lot of us uh, that we're in competition and uh, particularly through these COVID times, I found it to be a very collaborative environment and we're working to build on that co promoting each other's programs in the for the ignite the arts festivals uh, sharing spaces in the community when we find uh, great venues uh, that get donated to us. Um, it only makes us all stronger as an arts community uh, and I think we're just continuing to build on that collaboration. Mm -hmm. And so to our audience has uh, have any questions come up for you, you can feel free to unmute yourself or um, in a meeting style here so any questions for our panel. If I could just jump in with another comment uh, with regards to collaboration during this time, we have found that more and more businesses are, are as Sarah was saying, it, it's a change from the old cutthroat competition to becoming that collaboration and, and people are willing to sponsor and to help out. And another great example, going back to Sarah's entrepreneur, junior entrepreneur program, was the number of people who came out to help and to, to, to lead different sessions and to help teach these, these, uh, these youth and to judge and to participate in, in that aspect of it. She had several business people who gave up a considerable amount of time to go and to see the students presentations and to be involved in in helping them grow and learn and it's just collaboration is becoming so much more prevalent and so much more important in everything that we do and I think many of us have learned over the years that you don't do anything alone anymore it takes a team to make things happen so it's it's really important Mm -hmm. And so when we do decide to get into these partnerships, how important is communication, um, establishing best practices and how you prefer to communicate? Can, um, can you share anything, anyone to the panel uh, want to take that on? It's I very important. Let's put it. it I'll, I'll jump for it. With all of the committee meetings we have, if we didn't have notes or minutes or some sort of backup, because we're all so busy. And the point in case is when you caught me with the deer in the headlight look, it's because there's such a great panel of women. My my mind is going 100 miles an hour. So if you don't get that down on paper and if you don't share it, it's so easy to to forget. And and it happens all the time because we live in a world of information as continuous information. So, yeah. Yeah, Kim Kim has, uh, Kim and I have a, a Facebook Messenger chat that, you know, we, we address each other when it's something urgent, I guess. And then other than that, it's been emails and uh, there haven't, hasn't been phone calls, but a um, lot of emails going back and forth. Kim reminding me that I need to update my posters or I need to update this or that and she just kind of keeps me in check. So uh, I would agree with Diane in that it's 
it's probably the most important part of this is keeping keeping that contact. Okay. I I would have to agree the the communication back and forth between uh, the different businesses you're working with, the different organizations, the committees, um, having it all in one place. Uh, and there's so many different systems out there that a person can use, but there's so many different possibilities, but definitely keeping those records, keeping those notes, keeping that information all in, in one spot so you can refer to it. And Pat, I love the, the fact that you, you commented on the fact that even though you don't necessarily have formal agreements, you've got that email train that you can go back to and say, well, this is what I said. And this is what you agreed to in your response. And so in, in some ways that's giving you that, that confirmation of, of what, what was agreed on and communication is the heart of everything we do. It surely is. And, and as I said, so many of the, the collaborative things that we do are specific events. And so those events have an awful lot of details and we're real sticklers for detail here. And so those uh, email chains set up those details and set up that this is what I'm hearing here. This is what I think is happening. Is this what you're thinking of? And let's just review this again. And so sometimes they seem repetitive, but they are nailing down the details that ultimately make whatever you're doing successful. If we're, you know, if, if we're all going in different directions, it's not going to be successful. And uh, um, uh, that's not helpful to anybody. So yes, indeed. Yeah. And, and I think one of the things I've noticed with different partnerships with different groups is different channels are required. Uh, there's some groups I know I need to set up a Slack channel. There's some groups, okay, we'll just do a quick WhatsApp chat. Um, or, you know, I've been surprised that some of my employees are like, no, no, Facebook Messenger is fine. Mm -hmm. And they, they, they were in their 20s. I didn't think anybody did that except pe people in our age bracket. So <laughs> it's it's also about figuring out what channel works for a particular partnership. And it sometimes means I'm monitoring a lot of different channels, but you have to pick the channel that fits for the group and the partners. Yeah, great points. Okay, well, as we wrap up the panel portion of the evening or, or the day, um, any final remarks from our panelists, any words of advice um, to, to send off with? Uh, Danielle, we have one question in the chat. Oh, okay. Fantastic. We got two um, now. Okay. So Cindy would be interested to hear tips from the panel members for making that first cold call pitch of an idea with a potential collaborator. I would recommend that you start with the need. If you're going to operate on anything, there has to be a need that is being met, whether it's the need of the person who you're collaborating with or the group that you're collaborating with, or whether it's a need that you have for your business, or whether it's both. It's easiest to start with that need. So if you're going to approach somebody that you want to collaborate with, I, I would recommend starting with the need and with the relationship that you can build on expressing and sharing that need. This is where my humor comes in. I'd suggest meeting that at the cannery for a beer to start. <laughs> <laughs> but, and I think we always need to be sure that we're, we're reaching out to someone and letting them know, look, this is just an idea that's going through my head. I want to lay it out before you. You can say yes or no, or I need more info. Um, and, and just getting started and sometimes taking that first step is the hardest. And actually to follow up on what Diane said, I think when someone is approaching me and, and says, I've got an idea for uh, a program, if they've got everything completely detailed in an email, I'm sometimes going to get overwhelmed and go, well, I don't know if that fits. If someone says, I've got an idea for a painting class, do you wanna get together and talk? And starting with that conversation uh, is, is, is generally a better entryway for me. I would also say pitching to the right audience is very important. Um, I, for, for the junior preneur program, I ended up with uh, three, four, five, six, I think seven or eight different sponsors of this event. 
um, the first of which was Diana at Local Landing, because she was the most appropriate person to approach for sponsorship for things to do with youth because of all the things that she does. So um, hers was an immediate yes. Um, and it's also figuring out how is this going to benefit the person you're pitching to. So it's not just, hey, can I have some money? <laughs> it's these are the things that you're going to get out of it. Um, yeah, just making sure that you're offering something in return. Yes, and so we have another question from Catherine. I think it's a great question. So you've all spoken a lot about the importance of collaboration, but you've all referred to the local market. For those of us exclusively online, it seems a bit more um, anonymous or, yes. So for example, um, you turn your head and there's a flood of Chinese knockoffs of your product for half the price. Other than trial and error, do you have any advice for reducing this old style of online competition? I'll make a quick comment on that. I'm not sure if I, if I can speak to the, the Chinese knockoffs at all, but in my business, my personal business outside of women in business, um, my business is all online and I share with people around the globe. and. We do so much by Zoom, um, by Messenger, by so many other of the channels that Kim was mentioning. Um, but we, we have very open communication and I am in competition with thousands of other people. And yet we're all working together because our goals and ideals are the same to help others. And so, it's coming back to communicating as to who is able to do what in what market, in what area, and working together to support each other because together we all rise. And, and I'll just add just quickly, if at all possible, get personal. Remember, uh, keep track of anniversaries, keep track of birthdays, mm -hmm. keep track of their, their, what they're always ordering. And then when something comes up, uh, you know, make sure that it's, it's personal. Um, I'd like to re just quickly refer to a company that I deal with, one of my suppliers, they're called Kind Humans Solutions, and they sell um, insulated metal water bottles. So basically like Yeti mugs. However, they do outperform Yeti in both hot and cold tests, <laughs> giving them a little plug here. Um, and something that, I mean, they're in a market with, I don't know how many competitors, uh, specifically many Chinese knockoff competitors. And I think what makes them stand out is number one, that they do have a higher quality product that people will eventually just keep coming back to. So do you want to buy four or five Chinese knockoff water bottles, or do you want to buy one really good one that will last you forever? Um, but also uh, they have something that differentiates them. And that's important in any business is having a, a differentiator, at least one. And their differentiator is that they clean up a pound of ocean garbage for every bottle that's sold. And they're out of Vancouver. So they're local-ish local to us, but they also travel all around the world and clean up ocean garbage. So having something that, that makes you stand out from your competition is so important, but also if you can add in that layer of uh, community support somewhere, um, I think that that gives you a huge advantage. And so Sarah, would you say with this company that does ocean cleanup garbage, is that a partnership that they've created with maybe a not-for-profit or are they actually the ones on the beach cleaning? They're the ones, the owner, the CEO of that company is on the beach cleaning with his staff. Wow. And so they're not going out like every day and cleaning up one pound of garbage. They're cleaning up like thousands of pounds at a time. And then, you know, they, they weigh it and they say, these are, this is how much we've cleaned and that, that sort of thing. And wow. um, they've actually 
indicated that they would like to come and help us um, when I'm wearing my JCI hat to clean up the river channel, which we do every year. So they will be here hopefully at some point to do that with us. Fantastic. Another great collaboration. Mm. Mm -hmm. So many examples. Um, any other thoughts? Uh, I think we have time for maybe one more question or just a round of uh, final thoughts before we move on to um, the legal aspect of partnerships. Okay, well, if that feels complete, thank you so much to all these amazing, inspiring women for being in the room with us uh, virtually. I think you are true leaders in um, how we can do business different, how we can do business better, um, and really how to rise that tide for women entrepreneurs and, and all entrepreneurs uh, within BC and Penticton. So thank you everyone for uh, the panel discussion. And now I will turn it over to Marlene to introduce our next speaker. So thank you panelists, great job. Thank you. Well, it is my pleasure, pleasure to, uh, to bring our next speaker forward. <clears throat> I had the opportunity to meet her a few years back now when she came to the Okanagan. And I am just so delighted to count her as one of my friends, but absolutely amazed at the wisdom that she has and the knowledge that she has of, of so many things that some of us tend to just take for granted or to, to look at from the well, that's just common sense. But she reminds me all the time of the fact that, yes, it's common sense for us. It makes sense for us, but you need to document it. It needs to be real. It needs to be written down. It needs to be put together in a format that protects everyone. And I've had the opportunity to work with her on uh, our governance committee with the Chamber of Commerce. And the way that she puts words together is absolutely second to none. Um, she, she can string them together and make them make sense and put that common sense into something that gives substance and, and legality to the things that we need to take care of in our businesses. And when we're collaborating with others, it is so incredibly important as we've been discussing. And now Hannon's a very, very busy lady. So she was in another meeting while we were having our panel discussion. So she didn't get to hear all the things we were saying about uh, our collaborations and some of the things we've done by the seat of our pants and some of the things we've done with a handshake and some of the things that we've done with terms of reference and contracts. But she's going to lead us through a few minutes here of telling us about why it is so important to have those things in place and to have our T's crossed and our I's dotted. So ladies and gentlemen from interior law and a woman who specializes in business law and knows it inside out, Hannon Campbell. Welcome, Hannon. Thank you so much, Marlene. I, I, I just uh, right back at you. I feel exactly the same way and I feel very blessed and, and, and very grateful to have you in my in my life. And um, so thank you for that. Um, I, yeah, as Marlene said, I, I so I, I, I missed the, the I don't have the benefit of um, having heard what you have all been discussing and so forgive me if I am repeating some of these concepts or um, stating what you've already <laughs> know if that's the case please stop me and ask me a specific question I'm I'm very good thinker on my feet so um, do not hesitate to take me off uh, off script in any way um, I, I want when I when when the topic was broached to me, um, I got to say I had a bit of trouble figuring out what exactly to say, because um, there's, you know, there's the legal side of all of this. Um, but then as, as Marlene said, there's the more common sense thing an approach to this and um, believe it or not even you know deals at the billion dollar level lose sight of the common sense. Uh, aspect of partnering and collaborating. And so I decided to talk about 
what what should you do um, before you actually commit in writing that you're going to collaborate or you're going to partner on something and um, because that stuff to me is almost more important than the actual you know agreement or contract the, the contract part should be reflective of of the discussions you've had i heard you know email threads and strings that have been exchanged and so that all culminates in the agreement but in getting there i think there's a few few points that my experience anyway has taught me that people tend to overlook the, the first one is what i call the business cultures and and are they aligned so you know, I, I heard many of you talk about, you know, how do you get this started? And uh, I believe it was Pat that said, identify a need. Um, you know, I think Diane said, let's meet at the cannery, you know, and talk. And, and that is all brilliant advice. The issue is, does that other side have the same culture as you do? So, for example, you want to meet at the cannery, they want to have a Zoom meeting or meet in office. So, you know, right away, you should be asking yourself, like, okay, you know, maybe they are a little more, um, you know, let's just get this done. Um, you know, all of these things are very telling right off the bat, uh, the reception that you're going to have. Someone mentioned know your audience. That's exactly what I'm talking about here is right off the bat, you need to make sure you click. This is a lot like the first date, if you will. Um, so are your businesses, business cultures aligned? Um, the um, a lot of times people don't really think too much about that, especially maybe if it's a quick partnership or a quick collaboration that's needed and and that may be fine. But if you're looking at something long term, you've got to make sure that, um, you know, they share your business values, for example, is um, are they all about profit? Uh, do they care about the environment? Do they care about, you know, for example, um, saving a bit of uh, saving the trees do they want everything printed and filed and will they insist on everything in writing as opposed to you know let's do this all digitally and electronically for example so it's it's these little things that that will kind of tip you off you know how much are they willing to share like when you're sort of feeling each other out um depending on the type of collaboration that you guys are entering into uh one of the important aspects may be the financial wherewithal of one of the parties especially if you're expecting them to kind of carry the costs of a, of a project or or a certain venture you're carrying out are they willing to to be open book what we call sometimes are they willing to you know open the like open the kimono <laughs> or like share what 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 they're about what their financials look like so i only say that you know spend the time that is necessary on that sort of due diligence uh part of the deal um again if we're talking low dollars short term quick turnaround it might not be it might not be an issue or it might be it might be you know a week of actual just living hell as you're trying to get through a project with someone that you know you thought you knew but maybe you didn't and and we all have those um examples so you know take that time um to really get to know the the partner that you're looking at the other thing um is need pat identified said you know you have to have a need and i can't agree <laughs> I, I can't tell you how much i agree with that um there's the initial sort of description of what the two parties are are going to be talking about but that needs to get really specific really quickly. Um, and I find people don't necessarily get into the specifics. They sometimes think that, well, if I'm having you come and, um, you know, do some uh, like bookkeeping or something, you need a bookkeeper, you you find a good bookkeeper, you, you bring them on as a contractor, you don't hire them as an employee, you just contract for their services or something. Well, what, what is it you're actually expecting from that individual? Um, are you expecting them to be present in an office or can they work? remotely are you expecting them to use their own equipment or your equipment are you expecting them to you know run checks or you know is that somebody else's job so i only use that example uh, because it happened to a client of mine who <laughs> 
uh, thought they had just uh, found uh, a unicorn, basically. This individual was willing to do anything and everything for them. Um, they described the services in their in their agreement as bookkeeping and left it at that. And so very quickly, it became obvious that they each had a very different idea of what this individual had to do. So that relationship um, ended very badly. And, and speaking of relationships ending badly, you always have to have an exit strategy. Um, people like coming together. They like putting deals and collaborations and partnerships together. They never want to think about the, you know, what happens if this relationship goes sour? And you have to think about that. Um, you have to think about how do I get out of this if I want to, if I need to. Um, and so map that out. Uh, are there going to be payment penalties, for example, if a party exits this collaboration? Uh, depending on the collaboration, who owns the, the product of this partnership or collaboration? Um, you know, who gets the benefit of, of work that's been developed jointly, for example. Um, so you have to think about how do I get out of this? And, and the reason you think about it when you're first partnering is because that's when everybody's reasonable and willing to kind of, you know, be fair in, in these kinds of um, decisions. When you haven't thought it out and, and you go and talk to someone, you know, look, I, I entered into this partnership and my, you know, my partner is stealing money and, and how do I, what do I do? How do I, you know, that's a very tough time to try to make rational uh, decisions, right? And so the example that I give are shareholder agreements. So not necessarily, I mean, it's kind of a partnership collaboration. I use those words loosely, but, you know, you start a company with someone and I can't tell you how many times clients will say, nah, we don't need a shareholders agreement. We're great, we're great friends. And, you know, we, do, we just find a way to work it out. And so they don't have uh, an agreement that says what happens to this company if, you know, I, I don't want to work with you anymore, for example. How do I get you out? And, and that turns into a very, very cumbersome, difficult, and, and quite frankly, um, debilitating it can be conversation because this is somebody it, the emotional aspect to some of this stuff can't be discounted um, so always have an exit strategy um, the last thing that you need to think about are the costs who's paying for what how often is payment going to be made what happens if a payment is late um, you know you, you need again it's kind of mapping out these sorts of what ifs so that when they occur or you know hopefully they never occur but if they occur you have a roadmap the what i like to do when when people come to me and say look we're, we're thinking about starting this you know collaboration or, or a partnership what how should we start i always say i mean it's a legal document but i always say enter into what's called a, a letter of intent um you don't need a lawyer for this so you take those email threads, you take the conversations that you've had, and you put them in an actual document that says, here's what we're going to do, and here's how we've agreed we're going to do it. And it's called a letter of intent because it is meant to be a fairly, you know, it's, it's a letter. It's dear, you know, dear Jane, you know, you and I have talked about this, you know, th that is the need. You describe the need in as much detail as you can. And we're going to work together on this on this project. And here's how we're going to do it. And it doesn't have to be more than about two pages. What I've told you are probably the most important parts of this, which is the costs. And how do we get out of this if it doesn't work? The beauty of having it in one document is no one's chasing any emails around. You both sign this document. And so it's a very clear indication that this is what we agreed to do. These, these letters tend to be non-binding. Non what that means is you're just, you, until you actually sign a partnership agreement or some other agreement, you're not gonna be held to these letters, but they sure do help when you go to the next step and start preparing the actual partnership agreements or whatever, whatever that formal document is that you need between you. Um, 
the, the two quick things I'm going to mention that you want to think about is confidentiality. Depending on the nature of the project, what you guys are talking about could be very, very confidential, like, like a new product, for example, that you want to create and you need to work with party B to manufacture it. Um, you need to make sure that what you're sharing with that party, that they keep confidential. You need very good confidentiality provisions in this letter of intent that I'm describing. This part of the letter would be legally binding. And so you have to think about protecting your, uh, your proprietary information. The other thing you wanna talk about or think about is exclusivity. If you're talking to somebody about designing a, you know, a, a, a water bottle, um, do you want to work exclusively with that party? Or are you going to tell them, you know, I'm talking to you, I'm talking to them, I'm talking to, over here and there to everybody. So make it clear because if the party you're talking to thinks you're only talking to them, that's, that is going to impact how the rest of these terms fall out, especially exit provisions, right? I mean, if you're working with a whole bunch of other manufacturers, you know, that, may, that may change their view on, on exit. You, they might want to be able to exit this a lot easier than if you're exclusive to them. So um, I, I would say those are so sort of like the, the most important things to think about before you put pen, you know, pen to paper. Think about that, get to know the other person, talk about these things, and then if it looks like it's a good fit, then start to document it. Um, initially, I would say with a letter of intent, so you don't spend a whole lot of time and money trying to paper something formally that you really don't, you guys don't see eye to eye on already. Um, but if you can get a letter of intent put together, that's already a great sign that you guys are on on the right, uh, you know, the, you're, you're heading in the right direction and you're thinking together, you're thinking, this is what it's going to look like. So um, I don't know if anybody, if this has been repetitive, if you've already talked about all these concepts, but I, I'm more than happy to field questions uh, about, you know, specifics and, and, and all of that. If, if we have time, Terry, I don't know. Hannah, that was great because you covered a lot of things that we <laughs> didn't talk about. So um, okay. that was awesome. And, and you you emphasize the things that we had said were most important. So oh, good. very, very much appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Danielle, I think I'm gonna turn it back to you to field any questions that we may have coming up here. <clears throat> Sounds great. And I'll echo Marlene's comments. Uh, Hannah and you did a great job covering what we did not. So it's really great to have your perspective and um, just reiterating those points of, of uh, making sure that you get the important pieces written down, that you agree to them up front. So uh, you're all on the same page and, and have that, having that exit in mind um, is definitely something we didn't talk about. So it's a great addition to the conversation. Um, any other questions um, from our guests? Anything you wanna pop into the chat? I've got a question, Hannon. Um, so just using my example of my my kind humans water bottle people. So if I'm going to buy from them um, X number of bottles and they've agreed to give me X number of percentage off because I'm buying this volume, um, do we need to have literally like a formal written agreement or is our text conversation binding? Text conversation would be binding if that's the extent of the transaction, right? But if this is if this transaction is going to occur over a length of time, then I would start to want to make sure I understand the obligation. So, for example, is the obligation going to be that you buy a set number of bottles all at once and you pay, you know, a discounted rate of, of this? If that's the extent of the transaction, that's that. Right. But if the transaction is we'll give you a discount of this if you buy this many bottles, but then you're committed to buy, you know, this many bottles later and so on and so forth. You know, that, that's like I said, the short kind of quick turnarounds don't matter as much. 
Um, but then again, I mean, if you, you know, you, you contract to buy a thousand bottles at this, this discounted rate and they turn around and give you, you know, a less discount, all you've got to prove is a text. And it's very easy to argue, well, I missed, you know, I, I made a mistake typing that. There's no signature to it. I didn't text that. I don't know who texted that. Um, you know, one of the other important points is make sure you're actually talking to the decision maker. <laughs> There's a lot of times where you spend a lot of time talking to someone and then you think you've got the deal all hammered out and then they go, okay, now I need to just run this up to so-and-so to actually get approval on this. And you know, right off the bat, I always make sure the first thing I ask when I'm, you know, in a room with like just facilitating a business conversation, the first thing I ask is, do I have the decision makers on both sides present in the room? Um, if I don't, then I already know that this is going to take some time. So, you know, the text is, it's as good as a text. You've got something, but, but you have no proof who texted that text. Um, if they had the authority to make that deal or not. So again, low risk, but just something to think about. Yep, thank you. You're welcome. Fantastic. Well, Hannah, thank you so much for being here, um, sharing your words of wisdom. Uh, we'll be sure to uh, follow up with uh, everyone's contact details if people have um, you know, follow up questions and that type of thing. So thank you, Hannon, for being here. Big round of uh, virtual applause for that presentation. And now let's turn it over to Terry, who is going to um, draw some names for prizes. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Terry. I'm with the Chamber. I do the events and marketing. So we have uh, put everybody's names in and used random.org. And we are very excited to congratulate Cindy from Boom Spiral Facilitation. Uh, Cindy, you are the lucky winner of a Meal More gift card. So that is a locally owned uh, clothing store here in Penticton. The gift card I'm sending you, I can send you via email and you can use their online shopping um, portal. Uh, so you, because I don't think you're located in Penticton, so this will give you a good idea of some of the local stores we have here. Uh, so that is uh, a gift from the chamber here. So thank you so much for joining us. And I have your email, so I'll send that out to you um, right after the call. That's wonderful. Um, thank you, Terry. What a wonderful surprise. And uh, no, I'm not in Penticton. I'm located in Victoria, but I certainly will look forward to uh, my next trip out to that area, and I'm, I would hope to look up quite a few of, of you wonderful uh, women when I'm there. So thank you. It is a beautiful spot to take a vacay to in the summer, for sure. Um, yeah, so congratulations. Our next prize winner is Felicia from SFPM Consulting. Uh, uh, Felicia, you have won a Babes Supporting Babes uh, hoodie from WeBC. So we will, uh, Danielle will connect with you. I will give you, uh, her, I'll send out an email to both of you. And then you can connect with uh, Danielle on the size you would require and where you wanted that ship to, if you're not in the Okanagan area. Uh, so congratulations. And Felicia is still still online, so that's great. Uh, our next prize winner is Lisa from Above the Beach. Uh, a bed and breakfast, I believe, here, like within the, uh, the Okanagan region, like maybe towards Naramata. And Lisa, you are the lucky winner of a Graphically Hip gift basket uh, donated by Sarah with Graphically Hip. So that is available to be picked up here at the chamber office. I'll email you with the details as well. And our- Terry, can I just interrupt you for a second and let yeah. you know that above the beach is above Skaha Beach. It's up oh. in the Valley View area. And Lisa is the brand new owner of this business. I am and thank you so much. I'm, I'm actually uh, just moved in last week and um and i really enjoyed your presentations this morning it's really 
really very um, informative and it feels really, um, it resonates with what we've come through and where we need to go. Well, welcome and congratulations on your new business. Thank you. That's exciting. Uh, so I'll send you the details on where we're located here in Penticton. We're right beside the peach. You can't miss us. Okay. And thank you, sir. I look forward to connecting. Yes. And our final prize winner is Mindy from Neil Squire uh, and Penticton Indian Band. Uh, Mindy, we have a gift basket for you from Cannery Brewing. So we'll have that available here at the chamber and we'll follow up with an email as well. Uh, so congratulations. Thank you. Wonderful. So thank you again for everyone that donated the prizes and thank you for joining us. And thank you to Danielle for moderating and hosting and keeping us all on track and on time. And thank you to our amazing panelists and to all of the women entrepreneurs out there. Uh, the difference you are making is, in, is remarkable. Thanks. Thanks to all of you. This was great. Thanks everybody. Thank Yay, you. And happy International Thank you. Women's Day. Yes, happy International Women's Day to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Here's Thanks to all of us. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.